Welcome to the Momentum Collective podcast. Momentum Collective provides training spaces and community around the world for unconventional minds and nomads to co-create the future. This podcast shares ideas on how we can transcend and shift towards our highest self. Greetings, everyone. Hello from Brave Earth in the mountains of Costa Rica. My name is John Early. I'm really excited for this conversation ahead uh, with Al Noor, one of the founders of Brave Earth. And um, I guess maybe we'll we'll just hear a bit more of your your background. You've been got a background that started in um, working through being involved with a lot of different protests and frontline movements, and now you've ended up with permaculture in a retreat center in Costa Rica. Tell us a little bit about about your journey of how, how you got here. Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm from Vancouver originally. Uh, my parents are East African diaspora. My mom's family's from Zanzibar. My dad's family's from Uganda. My dad was exiled in 72 by Idi Amin, you know, that whole story. And um, yeah, I was in a refugee camp outside of Vienna for a couple of years and then got shipped to Vancouver one day on a UN program. And so we're definitely, you know, like all of us, uh, products of, of uh, the gods of fate mm-hmm. and, and globalization and displacement and capitalist modernity in general. And so I grew up with a quite sort of internationalist lens and background, you know, having grown up with my grandparents and my dad and my uncles and my aunts who had all been uh, exiled and, and um, sort of, yeah, you know, forced, forced migrants, essentially, and um, I grew up in the climate movement and, and then the anti-globalization movement, and also started to understand that, yeah, we, we can't really, you know, <laughs> when I was studying climate science and climate change, like, uh, this organizer uh, named Feroz Manji, East African activist, said to me, climate change is not man-made, it's capital-made. You can know all the climate science you want, and if you don't understand how the global economic system works, you're of no use to us, mm-hmm. you know. And so I went and I, and I studied international business and economics and was like, okay, I'm going to you know, develop my understanding of how the oxygen works, essentially. And so I worked in think tanks and I ran my own political consultancy in London and then in New York. And then um, Occupy happened in 2011 and, and that had a big effect on many of us who were living in New York and doing activist organizing work. And then we set up an organization called The Rules, which was an activist collective. Um, it was an anarchist organization, so we only lived for eight years. We decided from the get-go that we'd only have this sort of eight-year experiment in yeah, learning how to make work and play and trouble together. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had an economic justice thing that was focused on economic alternatives. And we had a movement support organization working directly with social movements largely in the global south. Brazil, Kenya, India, South Africa, India, and uh, Nigeria, Colombia, we spend a lot of time in. And in many ways that was like formative work, understanding how it didn't matter if somebody was working on a tax justice struggle in Kenya or a land rights struggle in India or a pipeline in North Dakota, uh, you know, or, or uh, you know, trying to live food sovereign life in Colombia in the midst of, you know, narco trafficking and guerrilla warfare, that these were all symptoms of the broader economic system of late stage capitalism. And um, in 2016, we, we set up Brave Earth and uh, two or three of the Rules Collective and other people uh, that we were other paths with spiritual paths medicine paths uh, mystical paths and also political work uh, decided to set this place up and um, we were planning it and thinking about it from probably like 2011-12 when we were setting up the rules one of the things we used to say is that we need both resistance work and renewal work you know we have to stop we have to remove the noose of capitalism from the neck of you know the majority of the planet and, and the living world. And we also have to build the, the lived alternatives and the embodied cultures of, of post-capitalism. And that we weren't actually planning on being in Costa Rica or setting up here. Um, 
I was saying to you last night at dinner, I did the two places I never wanted to end up were Costa Rica and Bali. <laughs> too many new age people, too many alternative communities, too many ayahuasca healing centers, and the universe was like, oh, you have a preference. You know, slaps you across the face and says, you know, yeah, enjoy paradise, you know. <laughs> and so, yeah, we ended up getting here in 2016 and um, setting up this space, setting up this community, yeah. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Yeah, I really admire that you're able to see the issues of, of business and capitalism and then kind of like, you know, bring your enemies closer and like go into study some of that work and study business to understand a bit more of how it works and like you said, the the ramifications of that across across the board. Um, we originally met at the Visionaries Immersion, um, which was a great uh, gathering of minds and you led a, a workshop there called Contextualizing the Kali Yuga and you also brought in these aspects of neo liberalism and capitalism and the effects coming about um, so how do you give like a, a, a short context of um, maybe we'll tap into it's a, a lot of information there um, for 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 getting getting out of this this capitalistic mindset what mm. what, are, what are the ways that you feel are, are the most appropriate and you've already brought in you know bringing into a co-op here for brave earth to try and bring some equality and release the the hierarchy of a lot of structures made, um, but what are what are the what are the things that you feel are the the prime ways to try and combat this this ideology that we've all kind of bought into mm -hmm. uh, for capitalism? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think the starting place is that we first have to understand the ideology and we have to understand how it works and how it manifests in our body. And so, unless we do that, we're, we're really just grasping at straws, right? And so it's just maybe worth saying a bit about uh, like how this system is, is working. Um, e even the word neoliberalism, I think uh, probably most people hearing this podcast are, will be unfamiliar with or it will trigger a sense of why are we talking about politics or using uh, obscure language, etc. One of the things I, 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 I often say is like, you know, imagine being in a in a bread ration line in Soviet Russia in like 1986 and spending the entire day waiting for your piece of bread and not knowing the word communism, not knowing the name of the system that put you in that. It's just what you're that's all, you know, yeah, right. that's what you and, and but we're, we're like that illiterate with capitalism. Right. And so uh, every aspect of our lives are is currently mediated by money, right? So we used to have many ways to acquire goods and services, fishing, bartering, hunting, gifting, etc., right? And now there's one way, which is uh, debt-based, growth-dependent currency, largely US dollars, largely printed by Federal Reserves, right? And so from where you live to what you did for a living, do for a living, what your family does for a living, how you spend your free time, if you have free time, um, who's in your socioeconomic bubble and circle around you. This is all determined by the vicissitudes of capital, right? And so it's in some ways, um, you know, neoliberalism is the oxygen that we breathe. And so it's really important to understand how that works and how that affects uh, our day-to-day -day lives and and creates the superstructure you know it's the invisible architecture that exists all around us right and one simple way to think about this and talk about this um, that is helpful to people who are who are um, maybe a bit new to political economy is is this idea of one two three five so in a debt-based system which is what we have you you print money at debt so by the very creation of money itself, we are creating debt, right? Which is future demands on resources, natural resources and human labor, right? We're inventing that. So federal reserves print money at 1% and they give that to uh, commercial banks who are essentially willing it, right? They're, they're asking for the printing of that money and then that goes to them. Then they lend that money at, on average at let's say 2%. That's what we call prime, right? And so it, 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 what that does is then it, that goes into the economy at the sort of multiplier, right? And all sorts of interest is born out of that interest. 
And then what happens is you have to grow the global economy at 3%. So it's very simple, right? The one, two, three part of it. Why? Because your growth has to exceed the interest in order for that money to be valuable, right? You want to grow the pie in a certain way that everyone has the ability to get some of that pie to pay back the debt so the whole Ponzi scheme can keep on going. And you know, World Bank economists and you know the IMF and the UN and uh, others will say, look, if you don't have 3% uh, growth, you essentially get stagflation or uh, you know contractions in the economy, recessions. And so, okay, so 3% doesn't sound like a lot, right? But it's a, it's a compound function, right? It's exponential. And so what 3% growth means is a doubling of the global economy every 20 years, right? So can you imagine a doubling of the global economy, double the amount of Big Macs, Toyota Priuses, Apple computers, single-use plastics, double the amount of fossil fuels? It's inconceivable, right? Ecologists and economists are unanimous that there will not be another doubling. And this is why we call this late-stage capitalism, because we're, we're, we're sort of approaching the end, right? And, um, and you know, this, this sort of particular brand of capitalism that we call neoliberalism, it's not like uh, this is... This is just the logical outcome of 5,000 years of extraction, separation from the natural world, hierarchy, patriarchy, uh, white supremacy, etc. It's just sort of the most current extreme manifestation of it, right? And so in that system, you're basically forced to double the economy every 20 years. We've already crossed four of the nine planetary bounds. We're already in the midst of, you know, 200 species a day going extinct. And uh, the, the sort of possibility of that continuing is, is impossible and not happening. And, and so, and yet we can't get outside of the path dependency on, on economic growth, right? And that's the paradox of, of capitalist modernity. You're, we're essentially forcing our own destruction for the benefit of very few people, but everybody is complicit in it, right? And then the five of the one, two, three, five is that uh, if you are a holder of capital, on average, you're getting about a 5% return. So Thomas Piketty wrote this very important book called Capital in the 21st Century. Uh, the, the upshot of the book is he studies 250 years of econometric data and says, if you are holding capital, you are getting roughly a return of 5% on a global economy that's growing at 3%, which means the pie is growing at a certain rate, but if you're a capital holder, your share of the pie is growing at 60% faster rate, right? So inequality, is not an externality of capitalism, like economists tell us, an undesired byproduct right. or side effect. It's built it's, in. It's yeah. built into the system itself. So if you are a debt holder, you will have exponential debt because we've made up this thing called compound interest. And if you're a, a capital holder, you will uh, have exponential capital potentially, right? So you get over a certain amount of money in your bank account, whatever that is, 10 million, 100 million dollars, you're literally getting millions of dollars a month in interest, right? Mm -hmm. Which then also puts you in this sort of elite group, socioeconomically, you have certain hedge fund advisors, certain people you go to dinner and country club with, who are putting you in certain investment portfolios, et cetera, et cetera, and the whole thing balloons, right? So. Uh, on average now, we're in a state where 93 cents of every dollar ends up in the hands of the top 1%. So by definition, wealth creation creates inequality. By definition, wealth creation creates poverty. By definition, wealth creation creates climate change. And it's all dependent on a racialized hierarchy where um, you know Western Europeans essentially had a 500 year head start on capital through colonization, imperialism, genocide, slavery, etc. And then we've removed every other way to acquire goods and services. And so you're in this state of sort of, um, it's essentially, uh, we, I call it distributed fascism. You know, it's not a centralized system. It's everyone behaves like a fascist through the ideology of neoliberal capitalism, which tells you to take care of yourself first that if rich people do well, that wealth will trickle down to the majority of the world. You know, all of that bullshit, all of the propaganda that's come with this, with this 
theocracy um, and and uh, deep ideology of, of modern capitalism mm -hmm. and that that's the backdrop for for everything we're doing and if we don't understand that context then we come up with really bad ideas like conscious capitalism and let's start a Tom shoes and maybe one pair of shoes will be given and it's like everything we're doing is extractive fossil fuel dependent perpetuating these violences and there's no way out except through it and you can't get through it till you understand the gravity of the context and the weight of what we are up against which is a 5,000 year momentum of greed short-termism psychosis patriarchy racism and hierarchy mm -hmm. and separation from the more than human world yeah and that was part of what you'd phrased it with the bring into the Kali Yuga and that for me was a big mind shifter of like getting out of the present moment how do you take this into the, the context um, of, of the Kali Yuga being, I'll let you explain that of, of this thing that's much bigger than just the short term but mm -hmm. it's it's this huge process that humanity is going through through the, the, the lens of the Hindu Hindu culture if you mm -hmm. maybe want to touch a bit mm -hmm. on, on the Kali Yuga yeah like wh why I like the Kali Yuga frame is because as you say it sort of brings us into more of a deep time understanding right it also brings us into a more cyclical understanding of time so in the Vedic tradition um, they, their understanding of time was these sort of deep long cycles of time right and uh, so it's, the math on it is different but there's aversion which is a 26,000 year calendar there's four yugas so there's four phases of that cycle uh, and uh, it starts with the golden age the Satya Yuga it degrades into the silver the bronze and then the dark ages which um, the consensus is now and what's what's interesting about thinking of it in that way like look you could use the scientific term and you could say we're in the Anthropocene we're we're in the age where uh, human activity on the planet is destroying uh, every ecosystem, uh, every biome, every aspect of the natural world and our future ability to exist. So there's a, a scientific lens on what this moment is. But what I like about uh, the Kali Yuga, as, as we're, we're saying, is that it makes us realize that there's these deep cyclical historical um, timelines. And part of the culture of neoliberalism and uh, uh, sort of the Occidental mind and Western dominance and Enlightenment rationalist materialist reductionist logic is that there's this belief that progress is an arrow that time is linear and that we are at the peak of that linearity right and that uh, you know this is the Bill Gates Steven Pinker argument right we are look we have a microwave in every house and you know they'll doctor the numbers to make it seem like poverty is uh, decreasing and we have this amazing medical technology and the internet and it's like yes at what cost we have a microwave in every house but there may not be human beings left in a generation and that's not an over exaggeration right like that's the context we're in we may be the last human beings or our children may be the last human beings on this planet as a result of our way of living and yes there have been amazing benefits to some people from that way of living Right? We have huge privileges, especially those people who have enmeshed themselves and have been rewarded by the capitalist operating system. And we've impoverished and brought in uh, billions of souls that are living physically very difficult lives, barely keeping body and soul together, and have created an entire, uh, essentially a slave army in the global south that we use to prop up our way of living right and so by by understanding the the that this is an aspect of the kali yuga um it sort of removes us from that sort of uh western homogeneous sort of thinking about time about our role in time but it also gives us a sense of agency because also part of the vedic spiritual tradition is this idea that we choose which yuga we're going to incarnate in mm. and there's pros and cons to incarnating in every yuga. For example, what they say about the Kali Yuga is that it's one of the deep tests of old souls to come at a time with sort of ultimate destruction, right? We're at a place of, you know, peak 
hubris, peak violence, peak patriarchy, peak racism, but also peak possibility. Mm. And part of the kind of esoteric lore of the Kali Yuga is also this is the time where the most uh, outer, we get, we receive the most outer planet help, you know, interdimensional beings, angels, spirit guides, etc. And it's the time where the most light is shone onto the earth because we require that assistance. And now, whether you believe that or not, I think there is something interesting about understanding that on a certain level, we have chosen to incarnate on the planet at this moment. And so we can see our current plight as affliction, or we can see it as assignment. Hmm. And so for that, yeah, how do we call in that help? How do we, how do we really, you know, what gives you hope when there's these numbers and these things that are showcasing that things are, are getting worse? What, what, what personally gives you inspiration and hope to, to shift and work through this, this challenging time? You know, I, I'm not a huge fan or supporter of the idea of hope on one level. Like, I, I think um, Stephen Jenkinson, who's a, who's a teacher on death and dying, um, he says an interesting thing. He says, uh, hope is inherently hostile to the present moment. And there, there's something about being in the deep messiness of now and staying with the trouble that goes against our natural instinct for comfort, for knowing, for certainty. And it, it, it's deeply uncomfortable, but deeply necessary, right? Because it's actually our desire for comfort and our own selfishness or taking care of the, just the people around us and our desire for certainty and knowing and reducing the entire world into the atom and then the atom into the proton and the neutron and the electron and now we know everything you know it's that human arrogance that has gotten us into this position and so in some ways what 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 drives me to do really anything in this <laughs> in this given context is the understanding that we are doing the redemption work of our ancestors by risking to behave differently in a culture that is hell-bent on destruction. Mm. And if we think about those who came before us, you know, we probably had a thousand generations of human beings each that lived largely miserable lives for us to be here at this moment now. And in that sense, we are the living prayers of our ancestors. And they are living through us in a, in a very real way. Um, and understanding that the mistakes they made and the choices they made for their self-preservation were critical in getting us here. And their, uh, let's say, choice architecture and incentive landscape and rationale for why they did what they did is no longer serves us as well mm. and they were not inheriting a planet that um, human beings have destroyed to this state and also had the self-awareness and self-reflexivity to understand that and so we're in a very different context and in that sense it's a privilege right, mm -hmm. to be at the edge of consciousness the edge of the expansion of what it is to know who we are, what we are, and what our plight is, and the odds don't look very good for us. And yet, karmically, there's nothing else to do except build the post-capitalist realities we want to see, mm -hmm. and to build embodied cultures that are in direct opposition to the dominant culture and are informed by a very strong critique of what industrialized, globalized um, culture has done to not only the more than human world and, and the living world, but also us, right? And there's deep healing in that, right? To, to be able to find those parts of the, uh, you know, settler, colonizer, imperialist, uh, violent war machine in us, 
and to actively deprogram that and maybe in some instances be the first in our lines the first in our lineages the the first in our respective cultures to actively dismantle those aspects of ourselves to potentially become something else is a deep and profound privilege and you feel that's part of the relieving of the the karmic um, ancestral work that needs to be done is to try and live that different life and approach that differently or how else do you release this yeah. um, em embodiment of multi generations multi yeah. ancestral work yeah of yeah well you know all of our ancestors and and uh, even the tribe of the living now we are products of the cultural con the the cultural constructs and the context in which we live right and those constructs have a very powerful hold over us right they 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 have physically they not physically colonized us not just mimetically cognitively intellectually spiritually but also physically and so finding those aspects of ourselves seeing the fractal nature of reality and seeing capitalism as one substrate of that fractal reality that has created certain patterns and behaviors and uh, ways of understanding within us and within our ancestral lines to actively acknowledge that and dismantle those and rewire those is it is deep ancestral work it requires uh, epigenetic rewiring it re also requires like a deep um, physical rewiring of our neural pathways etc right and when we look at like all this like achievement culture stuff right and the kind of Silicon Valley douchebaggery of neurohacking and all of this stuff. It's like, to what end are they doing that, right? To be better capitalists, to be more successful in their bullshit businesses that are destroying the planet. And, and yet there's an appeal in it, right? Because there is something to be said for doing this work of uh, rewiring, reprogramming, decolonizing, our own consciousness, not just for ourselves, not order in just in order to achieve some kind of peak state, but to achieve some epigenetic transformation, restoration, and harmony. That to me is a much more interesting and motivating reason to to do this spiritual political praxis. And it's also why, when we talk about the fractal nature of reality, like capitalism is not something outside of us. It's also living within us. And the deeper we understand culture and its influence on cognition and the discursive relation between these things, um, the more mastery we get into in our ability to shape and interact with a living planet and a living cosmos. Mm -hmm. I, I remember asking you something similar when we were at Visionaries and, um, and there was something along the lines of, you know, the realization that 90 seven percent of all species that's ever been on this planet has has passed mm -hmm. and maybe i'll maybe let you rephrase it if, it if i'm saying it incorrectly but you know maybe it's in our in our field or in our highest interest to step into the next state to transcend to um reincarnate into the next life is how do we die gracefully as a species mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that really landed for me of like again taking that macro step out it's not just about me in this moment it's not just about our species like right here in this in this multi-generational thing but taking this out in the context of infinite realities and, mm -hmm. and millennia of like shifting into that so I don't know if that you wanted to touch on anything mm -hmm. there but that that's a again these ways to really shift the the, the ego of the human mind into mm -hmm. these these things that go so much further beyond mm -hmm. um, beyond this reality here yeah yeah I, I, I think I remember that thread I was just thinking out loud but you know, it came from this idea that 99% um, of all species that have ever existed on this planet are currently extinct, right? So all this massive biodiversity of life we have on this planet, you know, 24 million plus species, is only 1% of all the life that's ever been here, right? And so in you could argue that the purpose of existence is not just self-perpetuation as people think it is. That might be the individual impulse or a species level impulse potentially, but the, the broader current and trend 
and trajectory of life is extinction. Just like the purpose of living is dying, right, as well. And, and uh, the moment we are born, the script of our death is also included in that you know, genetic codon and sequencing. And so if that's the case, yeah, maybe part of the, the, the test of this moment of being a species on the brink is to learn how to live and die well at, at a species level and it's definitely on an individual level like if we look at the mystical traditions and the spiritual traditions um, and indigenous traditions their sole aim in many ways or, or a core practice I'm thinking ancient Egyptian cosmologies Islamic tradition for example you know the prophet used to say prophet Muhammad used to say one of his uh, famous lines is, is die before you die right like the, mm -hmm. the, the the sort of practice of the deathless death is is central in Sufism for example and and part of that is the reason for that is how you die is more important than how you live because it's the culmination of all your lessons in the moment you think you're really losing everything right and so death becomes the gateway and the portal to the unknown, to mm -hmm. the great mystery, to something beyond. And, you know, that may be the moment where uh, we can reincarnate into the rings of Saturn or whatever, if we, if, we know, if we can cultivate our ability to surrender in the face of what seems like imminent destruction. Right. Well, we are living here today, and we are in the 3D world. Um, and a big part of things that have been shifting, especially during these post-COVID times, during COVID, is living in community, coming back to, you know, no shortage of, of eco-communities popping up, especially in Central America and Costa Rica. What, what does, how do you define community? What does community mean to you? You know, it's, it's, um, it's a difficult question in, in some ways because, you know, like everything that happens in globalized industrialized culture it's become it's a word that's become meaningless and generic and commodified um, and you know I know people selling plots of land for you know extortionate profit who say they're setting up communities right and in, in, in some ways there's many there's, there's multiple ways into the answer of this right one way is that community is not necessarily the people that you start an intended project with, but it's the, the people who you're left with. You know, it's, it's the people who um, you'll be at their deathbed and they will be at your deathbed. And, and that's an interesting sense of community. Um, it's also people, another way in is uh, community is the physical embodiment of culture and so it's people who share culture are worthy of the title of community mm. um, you know another way into this is you know community how we define who our communities are, are, the, are the people who I reincarnated for mm. you know that the, the pull of the love was so strong that I came back to be entangled with them in that way mm -hmm. and there's been a large group of people coming together in this way um, plant medicine has been more comp more popular than ever um, do you feel that it's been a good way to to awaken people into this potential and to getting out of this paradigm of mm -hmm. capitalism or do you feel that's become another aspect, obviously another aspect of, of capitalism is just another way to profit yeah. off of off of these services, these ceremonies? Yeah, it's a, it's a really, it's a good question. It's a difficult question. Um, I don't think it's binary. I think that um, I personally believe that ayahuasca is the most important plant on the planet. Um, the shifts that have happened in my life through working with um, the grandmother with this vine um, 
are not even explicable right like i am who i am because the consciousness of that plant uh has um entrusted me with lessons and insights and a merging of consciousness that has been profound and i've seen its effects uh its positive effects on hundreds of people around me um and at the same time i see a lot of abuse of ayahuasca and plant medicines in general i think the immature spiritual egoic limited mind of the western occidentally trained socialized uh you know mind heart soul complex is a very seductive thing and can convince anybody of anything and that it can amplify um certain neuroses and pathologies so i i've seen people become narcissistic through the use of psychedelics i've seen them become delusional i've seen people use ayahuasca to be better capitalists and do i think it's the fault of ayahuasca no i think it's the fault of an immature culture that doesn't understand uh reverence for sacraments and doesn't have a sense of initiation and so uh you know young western people who have not been initiated into a culture worthy of the name culture are going to find any excuse they can for more escapism, more extraction, more consumption. And uh they do it with yoga and they do it with you know the Tao and they'll do it with ayahuasca and there there is no understanding of what is sacred in the dominant culture and so as products of their culture they're going to replicate that misuse and that abuse and that disrespect and you also see that everywhere. And I see it just say and it's same with community. right i look over all over costa rica there's you know not many communities i respect i don't see them living in body practices i see them as you know extractive gringos um who are t- telling themselves they're doing regenerative community building and it's the same thing in the ayahuasca community right and um i i think there needs to be like a deeper discourse and a deeper dialogue among people who are uh claiming that they're in these practices to find ways to protect the amazon like if you're working with ayahuasca and you don't have some kind of uh embodied vested support of the amazon and the indigenous peoples of the amazon then you're living in conflict because you're getting this huge benefit from the matrimony and patrimony of these cultures that have risked life and limb to preserve these ancient traditions in the midst of colonialism imperialism slavery genocide of probably the ancestors of most of these people who are now getting the benefits of these plants and have no reciprocal understanding or even an understanding of reciprocity at all and so i think all of these things need to be addressed and discussed and just also internally reflected and i also think there's a conversation about how much medicine do we need and why and who's deserving of medicine why do we feel entitled to medicine um and how are these medicines being harvested and a whole set of complex things what are the cultural containers in which this medicines being held who's serving that medicine what's their tradition what's their lineage uh, how are they in reciprocity with their community and their land and their lineage and their culture etc and these questions are not mostly asked right mm-hmm. and people will pay their 200 dollars to sit in ceremony and then are you know feel like well I pay $200 for this so I'm entitled to this download and a third cup and you know it's just commodification culture everywhere mm. right because you have people who don't understand the broader context of what's happening and so they're not situated in anything except their own preference and their own entitlement mm. and that's what this culture rewards mm. like what is social media it's essentially preference porn it's here's what I like here's my cappuccino here's my favorite color and it's all this reification of identity and identity is the problem right if we look at mystical traditions and indigenous traditions their practices are aimed at dissolving subject object duality of transcending identity right in order to prepare for the ultimate dissolution of identity which is death and our culture is not only death phobic as steven jenkinson said but is solely focused on 
strengthening personal identity because that's what's good for consumption and that's what's good for growth and that's what's good for capital as a adaptive complex evolutionary artificial intelligence mm. you know so the whole thing is feeding on every other substrate of the psychosis that is distributed amongst us everywhere and no one's outside of it anymore yeah so what were some of your priorities with um and things to implement that you're implementing now at Brave Earth to try and 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 reverse some of these 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 ideologies and these mm -hmm. these patterns. Yeah, so there's there's maybe kind of three levels to look at this, um, and and maybe like let's say three vectors for the praxis of systems change, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, at the highest level, it's the superstructure itself of of late stage capitalism, and then there's the community, and then there's the individual. So, at at the individual level, like like I come from a mystical tradition, I come from a Sufi lineage, and I come from an anarchist political tradition, and so <clears throat> I don't feel like <clears throat> I'm in the I'm in the business of telling people what to do, and uh, or how to do it, right? But I I I do think that the, the individual work of decolonizing and deprogra deprogramming our heart, soul, mind, somatic complex from the tyranny of colonialist, imperialist, white supremacist thought and patriarchal thought it, and all the, the complex of ideas that are attached to that, separation, hierarchy, commodification, transactionalization, entitlement, privilege, victimhood, control, all of those need to be addressed at the somatic level, at the psychological level, at the epigenetic level as individuals. Like that is our task, that is our work to do. Right? There's an old line from psychoanalysis which is what we don't heal in ourselves we transmit to others. And so there is yes on a mystical level there's only one of us here and yet you're incarnated in your individual body with your individual karma and the individual set of consequences that come from your beingness in the world and that is work everybody needs to do and there's infinite ways into that work from psychedelics to tantra to yoga meditation whatever your practice is in activism and political work but that praxis needs to be cultivated, developed, refined, questioned, and constantly lived and embodied at an individual level. And then at a community level, sharing those practices with each other is critical. And so at, at Brave Earth, for example, we talk about like our three areas of inquiry, our eros, polis, and gnosis. So eros is rethinking relationships with ourselves, with the more than human world, our erotic relationship with the natural world and other species, but also the relational lines, and even the traditional pair bonded relational line. And then polis, you know, rethinking the political economy, um, rethinking how money works. And so when we bought this land, we put it into a trust because we don't believe in traditional ideas of ownership. We believe in stewardship. We run out any economic aspect of this community, whether it's the retreat center or the regenerative farm or um, What you know, selling. If we decide to engage in commerce, that you know, as selling tinctures or products or whatever, is that that is run cooperatively. The profits go into a profit pool. It's distributed with no distinction between labor and capital. So whether you put in money as a partner or you work here, that there's governance and decision making as well as profit sharing that's shared equally. And so trying to just live these lived embodied. Um, experience is to just know what it's like and it is deeply uncomfortable to be in direct democracy processes and assembly processes and uh, you know uh, be, get one twentieth of what you would have got if you did, did it by yourself but who wants to live in a hierarchical system who wants to be somebody's boss like uh, unless we do that individual deprogramming work and remove those needs for us from us right that come from a sick culture the need to dominate others, the need for status, the need for reward, the need to be seen as innovative or an entrepreneur, 
right? Like entrepreneurship is a disease of the mind, right? And so if we're going to engage in economic activity, is to engage in cooperative distributed economic activity that enriches others and creates a bioregional effect. And, you know, also uh, a large part of our profits and shares go into setting up this local mutual aid network called Fuerza de Amor. Um, that's, that's aim is to create a strong, resilient, local ecosystem, economy, community, bioregion. Because, you know, we can create all the, uh, you know, sovereign, self-sustaining, alternative communities we want, but if they're not embedded in deeper bioregions that are land sovereign and food sovereign and energy sovereign and medicine sovereign and culturally sovereign, then we're just going to be embedded in an uh, unresilient, globalized industrial system that is going to collapse in the next, you know, five to 20 years anyways. And so that's part of the, the polis work. And then for the gnosis work is, gnosis is, you know, direct relationship to wisdom or the, defi the divine or however you see it, but it's this, this, this experimental and direct uh, sort of mystical tradition, right? Sufism is part of a Gnostic impulse, uh, the Christian mystic impulse, Kabbalah, Taoism, many indigenous cultures, these are all Gnostic cultures because they preference the subjective experience that you have. And so we share that with each other and we do counsel and we sit in ceremony together and we invite different indigenous elders and spiritual elders here so we can be in an ongoing, active dialogue and discourse about our practices. Mm -hmm. um, and so at the community level, all of these practices are, are really important because you're doing it with other people who are also rewiring and learning what it's like to be in a space of, for example, direct democracy, right? When we're told the democratic process is voting every four years, uh, between irrelevant parties in a corporate government nexus, right? It's really hard to spend two hours a day uh, or an hour a day or whatever in these democratic processes. So th 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 there's sort of that aspect. And then at the superstructure level, so we talked individual, community, and superstructure, it's this, this idea that we just take care of ourselves and build our own community and that's our responsibility and all we can do is sort out our own backyard. This, this is the logic of... Um, privilege and entitlement and um, uh, a lack of understanding of the fractal, quantum, interconnected, entangled reality. So we spend time, I, I try to spend 50% of my time on local work uh, and bioregional work and 50% of my time doing international solidarity work. We're helping to connect dots between social movements and other work happening in the world being in solidarity in other ways, trying to shift uh, whatever it is, policy, systems, cultures, uh, at a global level. And there's no right way to do that. That can be done through music, it could be done through documentary, filmmaking, it could be done through content, whatever. But just this understanding that the global field affects the local field and vice versa, and these are discursive phenomena. And uh, our job in this lifetime is to take down the neoliberal system that is our brief as a generation and at the same time we have to live the embodied alternatives at a local level but if those alternatives are not rooted in an understanding and a critique of the dominant system we will replicate the hierarchy and the patriarchy and the racism and um, the the entitlement privilege culture and the private ownership culture that created this mess in the first place. Mm. And so multiple layers of reality need to be accessed in order to avail ourselves to, you know, adjacent possible futures. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, we're limited on time. Mm -hmm. I know you've got to get running. Yeah. Um, I've got one final question, like under the ideology that, you know, we are coming from this collective source. We are all, all reflections of, of uh, this collective field. And the planet, why why would the planet bring bring humans into life and into this into this manifestation of itself? What what benefit is the planet itself 
uh, reaping from from humans on uh, existing. Yeah, it's a good. It's a, it's a it's a it's a deeply philosophical question and, and an important question. And in in some ways, I I, I think what that the answer is simply we don't know, right? And then if I was going to um, engage in conjecture, what I would say is um, the human beings that live a billion years from now are going to be as different to us as we are to single cell amoebas. And even with the collapse of our of civilization and our species and this massive dieback that we are instigating through uh, a growth obsessed consumption culture, there will be human beings left, right? There may not be a lot and we may see a massive tragedy. We may see the death of seven or eight billion human beings due to the essentially a desire for certain people in the West to live a certain way and, and obviously a globalized elite now. Um, and there will be a massive dieback and a massive uh, uh, set of consequences that will have deep emotional, spiritual, cognitive, genetic, epigenetic, cultural implications. And that may be part of the process to inform those humans that live many generations from now on um, on what they can learn from. You know, this mm. may be our genetic, epigenetic, civilizational initiation. And the idea that human beings are somehow serving a purpose because we're still alive, I question. I think there was probably a time where human beings, there definitely was a time, you know, we were hunter-gatherers for 99% of human history, and we were living in symbiosis with the natural world, and we served an important role as uh, companion species in the ecosystem. We have not been doing that for the last 5,000 years, especially not for the last 300 years. And I think Pachamama, or Gaia, or however you want to see it, um, uh, is questioning whether or not she's going to withdraw her support from us as a species. I, I feel that when I go into psychedelic state, that she herself is in turmoil on whether or not she wants our continued existence. Because if we're killing 200 species a day, because we can't stop flying planes and ordering Amazon.com and shopping at Walmart, uh, it's a pretty fucking stupid decision, right, that we're, we're, we're making. And, and I've heard many indigenous elders also say, that Pachamama is deciding if she wants us to continue or not. And, and part of me also feels that, look, if we even zoom out a bit and we say the average sun in our sun, sun's category, you know, uh, lasts 10 billion years uh, and uh, we're, you know, probably around halfway there. Um, that at some point, uh, guy in life is going to have to find a vehicle to live outside of potentially the solar system, this galaxy, maybe even this universe, if there are parallel simultaneous universes or, or you know, strings of reality or, you know, quantum gravitational fields or however you want to see it. Um, and that maybe human beings will, will play a role in that. Like when... He, humans went to the moon for the first time and looked back at the earth like Gaia was seeing herself reflected back for the first time in that way and so we serve this very unique interesting position in the Gaian entelechy and yet we are also um, not serving our function well right now mm -hmm. and we are really at a crossroads and I don't think anyone knows which way this road is going to fork mm -hmm. Thank you for your time and for your, all of your insight. Mm -hmm, I think there's you. a lot of deep uh, reflection and, and questions and, and things for us all to, to soak up after this. So thank you, Elnor, for your time mm -hmm. here and for this beautiful space here at Brave Earth. Um, John, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. And, and hopefully uh, everyone can, can take that reflection time with them home and uh, into their hearts moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, you. For more info or content from Momentum Collective or to apply for one of our international artist residencies, visit MomentumCollective.com. That's Momentum, M-O-M-E-N-T-O-M. -O -O the Momentum podcast theme you're listening to is the track Beam Me Up by our friend and producer Arterium. For more eclectic soundscapes, find Arterium on SoundCloud.